and welcome to the Mr. Know-It-All podcast, where we're allowed to have our opinions, even if they're bad and wrong. I'm Michelle, and I'm here with Mark, who plays bass in the band Platypus Egg. Hello. And Mark is the wackiest songwriter. <laughs> what was that supposed to mean? I agree. I still don't know. I think you know. And I will take it as a compliment. <laughs> and I'm here with Chris, who plays drums. Hi. And I'm Michelle, and I'm learning all of Chris's old guitar parts, and damn, it's taking a long time. It's hard. No, it's fine. (laughs) It's going to be great. Thank you for joining us again. Last time we talked about our favorite 70s drum recordings and a little bit of early 80s, and we talked about how drum recording developed over the course of the 70s and evolved and how clarity kind of improved over the course of the decade. So now today we're here to talk about where did the metal sounds start to come from and what were some of the strategies that producers of this type of music, what did they do to start to get that metal sound? Chris, would you like to start us off talking about our first track, which is Vazdiz? Yeah, we probably need more context. As always. <laughs> the word context is probably the word we've said the most on the podcast Yeah, we, so we already far. used the term metal and I guess it's questionable for all of these tracks. Like, is it even metal? But what is unquestionable to me is that it influenced what was definitely metal in the 80s. And I feel like we should talk about John Bonham of Led Zeppelin. At least, like, mention him. Don't say that name. <laughs> <laughs> Not in this house. Because he sort of raised the bar in terms of having a drum sound that is big, and for loud rock music. And they were one of the first bands to actually sound good on record, in my opinion. Yeah. We learned in our research that this track Vast Is by Wishbone Ash was engineered by Martin Birch, who was kind of critical in defining the, the 70s metal sound. Vast Is by Wishbone Ash was 1971. Yeah. This was two years after Led Zeppelin's first album. I think, that, I think that was 1969. He did not do it the way Led Zeppelin did. I think they had a different approach. I'm not really sure about how they did it, but I believe Jimmy Page was their producer, the guitarist of Led Zeppelin. Mm. Um, I just want to clarify something. I said they were the first band to sound good on the recording, but I meant heavy rock band. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> do you have any good examples of a heavy rock band that yes. didn't sound good yeah. before Blue them? Cheer. Oh, okay. A lot of people debate what was the beginning of heavy metal. Yeah, yeah. Debatably the first metal band. Yeah, Blue Cheer was early in this canon, I guess. I, I don't know exactly when their... What was that song? The Summertime Blues? Mm. Their version of Summertime Blues. Yeah. yeah. It's loud, it's heavy, it's distorted, but the recording is kind of trashy, <laughs> which is kind of charming in its own way. Like We've never really heard anything like that yeah. at the time. I feel like Led Zeppelin sort of stepped it up in terms of a bit more polish in heavy rock or hard rock or heavy blues, which is really what this music was at the time. Can you speak to the strategies used by Blue Cheer or Led Zeppelin to record their drums? I don't don't know much about Blue Cheer. I feel like Blue Cheer was just kind of wild and recording engineers didn't really know what to do with that at the time because it was like the mid 60s, I think, or Mm -hmm. maybe late 60s. I'm not really sure. And I feel like Led Zeppelin had more of a vision. And maybe because one of the band members was the producer, it turned out better. Oh, yeah. But I I think everyone knows the impact of their sound on hard rock and eventually metal. That's really where it begins. And in particular, John Bonham, he raised the bar. Mm -hmm. So there are other bands at the time that were doing heavy music like this. Deep Purple is notable. And I feel like this first band that we're talking about, I forgot what they're called. Wishbone, Wishbone Ash. Ash. They're kind of more obscure, but they were successful in their time. But when people think about this kind of music today, I feel like not a lot of people know about them. Um, I didn't even know about them until like five years ago or something. Dude, Seven like, I'm pretty sure at least one or two people suggested that I listen to them. And I may have, but it didn't really stick until we listened to it together. Like, oh, this is amazing. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Some more context. Uh, The producer of this track is Martin Birch. And he was working with other bands like uh, Deep Purple and... He worked with Deep Purple and... Didn't he work with Jeff Beck? He did work with Jeff Beck. Oh, Martin Birch also worked with Ronnie James Dio. He worked with Rainbow. 
and Black Sabbath. He produced a lot of the tracks that we'll be talking about today. And Iron Maiden, but that's going to be on a later playlist. But by then, he had really developed his strategies. Yeah. Yeah. For this first track, it was, what, 1971, I think? Mm-hmm. So... I don't know if he was still figuring it out, but this was still pretty early on in his career. Wait, so Martin Birch produced Wishbone Ash? Yeah. I believe Martin Birch produced the first three Wishbone Ash albums. Mm-hmm. This track, Vazdiz, is on their second album, uh, Pilgrimage. Okay, I need to say some things. So when Martin Birch was starting out, the first album that he worked on, just kind of cut his teeth, was Beckola by Jeff Beck in 1969. That was his... I think it was his first one. As an engineer? Yes. Okay. And this album, they really developed Beck's guitar sound. It was, I don't know, like a little, a little better. Maybe he was just starting to like overdrive the sound. Yeah. And that's an important part of his production style is not being afraid to go into the red on the preamps. Yes. And that works really well for a harder music, like hard rock. Yeah, so I'm going to get to that. Cool. So the next important album that I researched was Deep Purple in Rock. And that was in 1970. Martin Birch worked with them on that one. Great album. This was the one where I learned that at the time it was really, it was kind of a no-no to like let all the meters go into red and like overdrive the recordings. But that's what he did for this Deep Purple album. And it became really critical to getting that heavy sound. And then, so he took those strategies. He continued to work with Deep Purple. Also, it says he worked with Rainbow and White Snake and Black Sabbath and Blue Oyster Cult. So he's very relevant to our interests in the context of this podcast yeah there were a bunch of songs off of all these albums that we discussed like oh we want to include that for the sake of time we weren't able to include all of the tracks we wanted to include um, yeah we were going to include blue Blue oyster cult but we decided to cut it but they're worth mentioning for sure yeah he was very critical to developing this heavy sound he wanted to duplicate the live sound and he was one of the first people to do so getting that really saturated drum sound that everybody would be emulating later. It's pretty obvious in that Deep Purple album you mentioned, In Rock. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, it sounds saturated and heavy. (laughs) So basically, he captured the volume of early metal sound. Yeah, to get the vibe of their live shows. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so Vaz Dis was recorded at Delane Leah Studios, which is the same place as Deep Purple and Queen. The song Vez Diz is actually a, uh, a jazz tune by Brother Jack McDuff, an organ player. It's a lot different from his version, but you can hear the jazz influence for sure, especially on the drums. It's a very jazzy style of playing drums. A lot of triplets, and I think it's, it's sort of like a waltz meter. I'm not really sure if it's like 6 8 or something, but. It's like a fast waltz. Yeah, a very fast waltz. <laughs> I don't know much about the drummer. Uh, did we get his name? Derek Lawrence? No, that's the producer. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Wait, can I say that? Steve Upton. Steve Upton. I don't know much about Steve Upton. As we were talking about in our last episode about Bill Ward, a lot of these early metal drummers or hard rock drummers, think about the context of when they were growing up. When they were kids, what was the popular music at the time? And what were their drum heroes, pretty much? It's probably people like Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich like jazz drummers or like big band swing drummers. A lot of early hard rock and metal drummers, that was their influence, that was their background. They play jazz. Same thing with John Bonham, Neil Peart, and as I said last episode, Bill Ward. And I could only imagine, especially just from, you'll hear it, this drummer is jazzy. Other things about this band that are pretty pivotal, I guess, in shaping what would eventually become heavy metal is their twin guitar. That is a big part of the Wishbone Ash sound. Uh, Sort of like Thin Lizzy also. I guess they're worth mentioning as well. (laughs) I think we should just listen to the song. Okay, let's listen to Vastis by Wishbone Ash. (laughs) 